welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, why don't you join me as we go before the Lord in reverence and in honor. And Father, we come before you today. God, we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we don't take it lightly that we can get to come and hear the word of God and to hear the to the teachings of Jesus Christ. And Lord, you know, we thank you for that. God, on this eve of a very great day for our, our nation and the birthday or the anniversary celebration of our, of our great nation, Father, we just thank you for the, the, the blessings that you've given to us to be in such a wonderful nation, Father, that we can come and freely worship when people around the world die just to read pages of your word. God, here we are tonight freely worshiping and freely listening and hearing and seeking after you. Lord, we thank you that on this, uh, on this joyous occasion for our nation, Lord, we say a special prayer for our leaders. God, our, our political leaders, Father, our president and our senators and our congressmen and our state officials and, and local government officials today, Lord, whether we agree or not, doesn't matter. Lord, they are our leaders. Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit would, would speak to them, would divinely inspire them, would lead them and guide them. Father, we thank you that your hand be on this nation. It is one nation formed under God. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that this be a blessed nation. While there is many things going on around, Lord, there are righteous in the land, and we thank you. Father, that this is a nation under God. Lord, we glorify you. Lord, we ask that you set a hedge of protection about our leaders. Lord, that nothing, no harm come upon them. Father, we thank you that you've placed them there in, in positions of authority. Lord, we glorify you for that. Lord, we don't come into church to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And so, Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and minister to us tonight. Show us things in our hearts and in our lives to, to, to work on, to reveal some things in our lives, bring things to remembrance that we've heard before, Lord. Stir the Word of God up, Lord. I pray that the Word of God would be a seed planted into our hearts, into good ground in our hearts, that we would leave and bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. And Lord, we don't ask these blessings just upon ourselves, but upon all the churches around the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers. And Lord, we thank you for all the denominations and the churches all around the world and around the Inland Empire. Lord, we thank you for them. Lord, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Coachella, in Riverside, in San Diego, and as well as in Temecula, Lord, our fellow rock churches. Lord, we ask that you bless them on this Wednesday night too as well. Lord, we thank you. Lord, to you be the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. As you're being seated, go ahead and grab your Bibles. Excited for the word of the Lord tonight. I'm going to take my coat off. I see some of you fanning yourselves. I don't want to fan myself too here. Well, oh, hi, girl. How you doing? She can have that. <laughs> All right. Tonight we're going to resume our discussion. We're going to resume our topic on great faith. If you didn't join us or if you're just joining us last week, we talked about a subject called great faith. Looking at the example of the Roman centurion and his interaction with Jesus Christ and some of the things that the Roman centurion and Jesus in their conversation, we, we looked at what a person of great faith looks like and how we can apply that to our life. Now tonight we're going to continue on the subject of great faith and in order to have great faith, we're going to have to do some things and we're going to have to go through some things in life so that we can continually grow and, and, and advance in our beliefs and in our walks with God. We left off last week with a statement that said this, a person of great faith has a great belief in Jesus Christ. You see, the Roman centurion just said, listen, Jesus, all you need to do is speak, and I know my servant will be healed. And so we're, we're talking about the subject of great faith. Now, when we talk about great faith, you need to understand that we're not talking about quantitative. All right, we're not talking about large versus small as, as far as in size of quantity of your faith. Why? Because we'll see this tonight. Jesus said that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Now, if you've ever seen a mustard seed, it's a very small seed. So it's not about the size or the quantity of your faith, but rather the great faith that we're talking about is the quality of our faith. And you and I, it is God's intention, it is God's design for each and every one of us to have a high quality, or even this, how about this, a high caliber of faith. God's desire, God's will for us is to be a people of great faith. That is why we are here today. Did you know that you're not an accident? Did you know that you just didn't show up on this world because two people got together and you came out nine months later? No, you are placed in this time for a reason. Did you know, I love this. 
Did you know that they send the best players at the end of the game? You know what that means? Hey, listen, time's running out. You're the dream team, which means God, is today more than ever, God wants you to have great faith. See, God didn't put the bench warmer out in the last minute. No, 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 no. You are not called to be a bench warmer. You are called to be a person of great faith, to be a world changer, to do something to your world around you. And so tonight we're going to look at some thoughts about great faith. You know, looking at faith, though, before we even talk about faith, we've got to understand something about faith. You can't live without it. Did you know that? You can't live without faith. Faith is, let me say this, faith is essential to your salvation. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that it is impossible for us to please God. In Hebrews 11, chapter, verse number 6, it is impossible for us to please God without faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is God. You must have faith. You can't even believe in God without faith. You know, the interesting thing is the Bible doesn't say that it's impossible to please God without love, without righteousness. Without, without, uh, without a good sense of personality. It's not impossible to please God. No, he says without faith. The Bible tells us one pre a, a chapter previous in Hebrews, Hebrews uh, 10th chapter, it says that the just shall live by faith. The Bible tells us that it's the grace of God that gives us salvation, but we receive that salvation through faith. So you see, you cannot live, exist in Christianity, in your relationship with God without faith. And here's the thought. Anything that's worth doing is never easy. If, every, if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? If, 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 if getting a million dollars was easy, which some millionaires will tell you it is, but let's just say if getting a million, oh, listen, forget million, all right? Let's, let's dream big. Let's have big faith, great faith. If getting a billion dollars or earning a billion dollars was easy, we'd all do it. It takes work. It takes labor. It takes training. It takes in, 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 an intense sense of being. Well, you know what? Anything that's worth doing, it's worth doing well. Anything that's worth doing is not always easy. And don't you know that faith, because it is essential, faith because it is valuable, faith is because we have to have it, it's not always easy, but it means, that, it means that we have to work at it. We have to push for it. We have to strive at it. We have to make it a point for our faith to grow. Because it's not God's intention for us to remain the same. Because people of great faith don't remain the same. So, we're going to look at some thoughts of great faith today. It's not the easiest of subjects, but I believe that as we leave tonight, you celebrate your 4th of July and you kind of digest and chew over the message tomorrow, I believe you'll be encouraged. And I want to give you some encouragement tonight, but we're going to look at, it's, it's a difficult subject when it comes to faith. We're going to look at this, the test of faith, the great test of faith. Because we test things. You know, faith is tested during our lives in order to stretch it, to grow, and to reveal weaknesses. We have inspections in our homes, in our projects, and things we do. We have quality control tests. Every time you buy something, when you buy a pair of pants, you reach into the pocket. Oftentimes there's that little paper that says inspected by number 12 or something like that. We have quality control tests. We have inspections. We have all, listen, some of you, some of you can't even remember it, but there were the times when you were in school. You had tests. What are tests for? To solidify what it is that you've learned. To solidify what it is that you've done. We have home inspections where we test, we test the quality of the homes that are being built. Why? To ensure that they meet the standards to, to, prov to provide shelter and protection in, in an event of whatever the, the, the earth can bring, right? Rain. If you don't test it for waterproofness and it rains, what good is it? We have to, so why would we not expect our faith, if it's essential to us, if it's important to us, why would we not expect our faith to be tested so that we could grow, so that we could stretch, so that it could reveal to us when it comes back, when we look back at the test and say, man, I failed that one. We can look back at it and say, all right, I have some strengths and I have some weaknesses and begin to deal with those things in our life so that we can continually grow into a position of great faith. So we've got to understand that our faith is going to be tested all of our lives. Look what it says in James. If you've got your Bible, turn to me to the book of James in the first chapter. James in the first chapter. If you don't have your Bibles, I encourage you to bring them. But if you don't have your Bibles, it's all right. We're going to put it up on the overhead. But, you know, I encourage you to bring them. And the reason why is don't just take our word for it. Get in there and read the Word of God for yourself, too. 
But look at this. This is one of those verses. Pastor Dan, I believe, talked about it on Sunday night. This is one of those verses that you read it and you kind of wish you never read it. You, you ever read you ever the Bible? You ever read one of those verses and you're just like, man, I think I would have been better off not knowing that. Ignorance is bliss. James is one of those. James is really, a, the, the book of James is really an attitude correction. I mean, the whole, the whole chapter just, or the whole book just really targets the status of mankind. I mean, just from the beginning to end, you can just see James just really going at it. Just really, you know, aiming for the bullseye. And look what he says in James, the first chapter, verse number two. My brethren, you, you've heard this verse before. Because you know, you've heard it, because this is one of the ones that stick in your mind because you wish you didn't hear it. My brother, encounter counted all joy when you fall into various trials. What? You kidding me? Are you kidding me? Count it all joy, rejoice when you fall into various trials. Oh, why, why, why? Look at this, why? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Back to verse number three. The testing of your faith produces patience. Yeah. The testing of your faith produces patience. Then he goes on to say, verse number four, going on to say, let the patience have its perfect work. We talked about this word perfection in Hebrews while we're on Sundays. We've resumed our, our studies back into the book of Hebrews. We've talked about perfection, going on to perfection. Hebrews in the sixth chapter in the beginning talks about moving towards perfection. What does that mean? Moving towards like the, the likeness of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus was the perfect one. So let patience have its perfect work or its work like Jesus Christ that, may you, that you may be perfect or mature and complete. You see... When you get saved, when I got saved, we didn't right off the bat have a, have, a, have, a, have a moment of great faith. We're babies, right? We've learned this in Hebrews. And when you and I first start into this thing, we don't know anything. We're babies. We need the milk. And as we continually grow in our, in our lives, as we're stretched and as we're, as, we're, as we're tested in our faith, our faith begins to grow. Our faith becomes strength and our faith becomes encouraged. And now all of a sudden we look at patience. The things that once set us off, no longer set us off. The things that once affected us in life no longer affect us like they did. Why? Because now we have patience, or now, we, you could say it like this, we have a sense of endurance. We are lively people. And that is God's intent, is that we would have patience, that we would have endurance to live this life. And not just to live this life to get through it, but to live this life well. God's desire for you and I is to not just exist. Remember, I just said, you're the dream team. You're here for a reason. God's desire for us, church, tonight is that you live life and that you live life well. That you be blessed, that you be prosperous, that you be healthy, that your family be blessed, that the people look at you. That's why Jesus says that we're the salt of, of the earth and the light on a hill. Why? That people would look at us and see that we are blessed and they would see that God is in us. So we are called to be blessed. We are called to do that. And by doing that, we have got to go through hard times. And what James is saying here is he's saying, all right, does that mean, Pastor Luke, that when I have hard times, does that mean, Pastor Luke, when, 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 when bad things happen that I just got to, you know, woohoo, not, not, you know, be, the, not be how I feel? Let me tell you something. Let's, let's be real. Can we be real? A lot of times we look at that verse and we think, all right, somebody in the family just died. I got laid off. I lost all my money or lost my house. I'm going to rejoice because the Bible says, count it all joy. Does that mean that you've got to rejoice when, when your uncle dies? Or when, when you have some? Listen, let's be real. God made us emotional people. God understands that you have emotion. What God is saying and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through James's writing is God is saying you need to have a forward-thinking mentality. Because looking at verse number 2, go back to verse number 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Go to verse number three. Knowing. Knowing. See, what he's saying is it doesn't mean that when you get laid off or when a family member dies or when you've got a hard time or you're going through something and you feel like nobody else is there, that you've got to be fake on the outside because on the inside you're dying. No. What he's saying is to be forward thinking in life and to say, you know what? I'm going through a hard time. And this time really stinks. But my knowledge and my faith in Jesus Christ, I can understand that, you know what? 
God has given me the ability to endure. Why? Because the testing of my faith produces patience. And in hindsight, I can rejoice because I know I'm going to make it through. I know I'm going to make it through. So does that mean, I'm not saying that you've got to rejoice when you've got bad news. But what you need to do is realize that you need to be forward thinking and realize that you're not going to be in this moment for the rest of your life. You've ever heard that term, hindsight is 2020. We're going to look a little bit about that. Looking back, going back to the trials and the tests of our faith. Once we've made it through them, we're going to look back and say, wow, that was a test. I either passed it or I failed. Let, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something too. Before we go any further, you may look back in hindsight as we're talking about this and the Holy Spirit might bring up tests that you've gone through in your life that you may have failed miserably. But that's okay. You know why? Because some of the greatest businessmen in the world, some of the greatest sports players in the world, if you don't experience, they'll tell you, if you don't experience failure in your life, you don't carry the motivation to move beyond that failure. So you know what? You might have failed a test. You might have dropped the ball in your faith. But that's okay. Why? Because you can move forward in your faith and begin to work on those weaknesses that made you drop the failure or drop the ball and move forward so that you can be a person of great faith. So listen, we're, we're, we're going to have to go through faith. You can't escape it, guys. You're going to have to go through trials. You've got faith. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's going to get tested. It's going to get squeezed. It's going to get stretched. It's going to get pulled. It's going to get pushed together. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get compressed. You're going to feel like you've got one thread left until the, street, the rope breaks. But let me tell you something. There is light at the end of that tunnel. Your faith being tested produces patience. So today let's look at some three ways. Three ways tonight of how our faith is tested or our faith is tested and then we'll conclude or we'll finish that statement by whoever or however it is tested. Our faith is tested. Number one, are you ready for tonight? Number one, our faith is tested by God. What? What? Pastor Luke, God, God is like, he's, 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 he's looking out for me. He, he wants the best for me. Pastor Luke, God, God wouldn't put me in trials and in and, and, and areas that would, that would cause heartache or, or, or pain. Let me tell you something. We're going to read this in the Bible. God tests your faith. Got quiet in here. You're like, what? God tests your faith. But let me say this. Let me just say this. Let's get it out, Let's get it out in the air, okay? Let's just clear the air right now, okay? Did you know that God tests your faith, but he doesn't test your faith because he doesn't know where you're at? God tests your faith because he wants you to know where you're at. God doesn't test your faith because he doesn't know where you're at. God's not looking at you saying, hmm, I wonder if you're going to make it through this right now. God says, hmm, I wonder if you realize that you're going to make it through this right now. We're our faith is tested by God. Our faith is tested by God. Go with me a couple pages back to Hebrews in the 11th chapter. We'll get there in a couple of years on a Sunday morning, so we've got time to read it now. <laughs> Hebrews in the 11th chapter. Remember, God doesn't test our faith because... He doesn't know where we're at. God tests our faith because he wants us to know where we're at. Hebrews in the 11th chapter, this is, we call this like the hall of faith. This is the, this is the chapter of faith right here. Hebrews 11 chapter. When we get here, oh my Lord, it's just going to be amazing. Hebrews 11 chapter, talking about Abraham, the father of faith. It says, verse number 17, by faith. Okay, let's talk about this. We're talking about the subject of faith. It says, Abraham, by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was what? Tested by faith, Abraham, when he was tested. Who was he tested by? God. Why? Because it wasn't Sarah that said, Abraham, go take my son to the mountain. It wasn't Abraham's servants. It wasn't the king. It wasn't the soldiers or the generals. It was God that spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, I want to see the condition of your heart. And I want you to see that if you... Listen, 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 listen. We're going to read this. I want you to see that if you are obedient... The blessings that come from your obedience will far exceed your expectations. That was, the, that was the method or that was the result of the test. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And who, and who he had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Going on to verse number 18 goes on to say, Of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Verse number 19 goes on to say, Concluding, 
Abraham knew. God said, take my son, give me your son. Abraham said, well, then if God said, I want your son, then there's got to be something better on the other end. So Abraham came to a conclusion that what God was able to raise Isaac up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Meaning that Abraham and Sarah could not have kids. So they were dead in their childbearing uh, abilities, yet Isaac came. You see, the interesting thing about this is if Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac, if you remember Pastor Deborah's message on Jehovah Jireh, if Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac, he was not just going to kill the kid and leave him there. He was going to kill him and burn him. So meaning that Abraham concluded that if I was to give my son to God, that God would raise him from the dead, meaning God would bring the ashes back to life. And yet now the Bible tells, remember the story of Abraham, as his knife's up in the air and God says, Abraham, stop! Now I know, now I know that you are faithful and obedient. Now God begins to deliver the promise to Abraham that your stars will be, your descendants will be like the stars in the sky and the sands of the seashore. You'll never be able to count them. And even to this day, we know who Abraham is across, listen to this, across religions. It's not just a Christianity thing. Abraham has its roots in almost every major religion because Abraham was the father of many. Because he was obedient to God, because he listened to God. Why God tested Abraham. Abraham passed the test and he realized that if I put my faith in God, he'll take care of me. Don't you know at that point, if God asked Abraham to do anything else, whatever. God, listen, you're going to take care of me. You provided the ram when I was about to give my son. What else matters? God will test us. God will test us so that we can see the condition of our hearts, so that we can see the condition of our faith. It's amazing. Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, tells us, don't forget the Lord your God. It reminds us, we read about this a couple weeks ago with Pastor Jim. That's why I don't have it there. I'm just going to summarize it. Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, reminds the children of Israel to not forget God who provided for them. Don't forget God because he gave you the manna. And the Bible says that God gave them manna to test them if they would listen to him and follow his rules. God said, you've got bread coming every morning. You only collect as much as you can or as much as you need for the day. That's a test. John in the sixth chapter, we were there a few weeks ago. Jesus sees the multitude coming and has compassion on them. And he leans over to his disciple, Philip, and says to Philip, where can we buy enough bread to feed everybody? And the Bible tells us in John the sixth chapter, he asked Philip that question, feeding the 5,000, because he wanted to test where Philip was at. Because God knew. See, it wasn't that Jesus, and the Bible says it was because Jesus, or because Jesus didn't know. He wanted to see where Philip was because Philip and Jesus were on two separate pages. But don't you know, after Philip failed the test, this is all right, after Philip failed the test and Jesus broke the bread and the fish and the loaves and fed the multitudes, that at that point, Philip and Jesus were on the same page. His faith was tested. His faith was tested. His heart was revealed. Now he realized, okay, I have a deficiency of the trust of Jesus Christ. Now I know next time I see a multitude and Jesus has compassion on them, I won't have to worry about how much money is in the bank to go buy them bread. Because I just saw Jesus take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 men. I'm all right. I'm all right. Our faith will be tested by God. Our faith will be tested by God. There will be a test of your faith, but know this, the end result in the test, listen, Abraham wasn't rejoicing. Abraham wasn't, wasn't praising God. Abraham wasn't bumping the, the hallelujah praise music on the way up with Isaac. Come on, if you're a parent, you know that Abraham was broken on the inside. Trying to figure out why. Why would God ask this? Why? But he says, I don't know, he doesn't know why. I may not ever answer, never get that answer. But I know that God's in control. Listen, the faith and the test that God is bringing to your faith, it may not feel good. It may not be great. It may not be wonderful. But know this, that the end result produces endurance. That God's doing it for your benefit. That God's doing it so that you can grow. That God's doing it so that you can see things in your life to work on. Because he doesn't want you to remain the way you are today. He He hasn't designed you to be stagnant. He's designed you to excel. He's designed you to prosper. He's designed you to move forward. He's designed you to progress. And the testing of your faith produces patience. So listen, even though God may test your faith, know this, that God is on your side. We're talking about 
Our faith is tested. How is our faith tested? Number two. Woo, this one's a big one. Our faith is tested, number two, by Satan. By Lucifer, the devil, the dragon. Whatever you want to call him. He's the same guy. Our faith is tested by Satan. Our faith is tested by Satan. Let me tell you this. Let me make this statement. I said this in the first point. I'm going to make the statement. I'm going to clear the air. Here we go. Ready? You ready for this? If you're writing notes, you need to write this down. Okay, this is, that's, why I'm, that's why I'm making a big deal about this. Satan, listen, 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 listen. Satan cannot stop God. Comma. Semicolon. Something. But he can try to stop you. Satan cannot stop God, but he can try to stop you. Yeah. See, God wants to bless you, but Satan can stop you from getting it. God wants to prosper you, but Satan wants you to not get it. Yeah. God wants you to grow in your faith. Satan doesn't want you to grow in your faith. He can't stop the word of God from going forward, but he can stop you, or he can try to stop you, I should say. Your faith is tested by him. Don't be mistaken. Don't be naive. Let's be real. Sometimes we want to believe that there's a God. We don't want to believe that there's this dark and evil force. Oh, that's too, Pastor Luke, that's too Star Wars or too sci-fi for me to have this good versus, I don't care whether you believe it or not, it's real. There's assignment out there for you. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is out to test and to rob you of your faith. But you don't got to let him do that. You don't have to let him. Luke in the 22nd chapter. If you got your Bible, turn with me real, there real quick. Amazing story. Remember I talked about failed tests? We talked about Philip not really passing that test. All right, Philip, Philip got a D, let's say, all right? He didn't, he didn't fail. Philip just didn't do well. Let's look at somebody who failed. Let's look at some. You know, this, this, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but there's times in my life when I don't do well at things, and it always makes me feel better when I see somebody else not do well at that same thing. <laughs> Am I alone? Or does misery love company? When I didn't get math, it was great to see the person next to me not get it either. Hallelujah, it's not my fault. It's the teacher's fault. <laughs> this is some encouragement because Philip may have gotten a D, all right? Peter got an F. All right, we're going to read about this. Look what it says. Luke 22, chapter, verse number 31. If you've got your Bible and your Bible has a heading, my Bible says this, Jesus predicts Peter's denial. F! F! Jesus says, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Peter says, uh-uh, ain't going to happen. I'm going to die for you, Jesus. F! F! Peter got an F. He, he did it. He lived, up to the, he lived up to it, right? Look what Jesus says. Look at this conversation. Let this, let this be an encouragement to you. Jesus says, verse number 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Peter, Peter, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Satan has asked for you that he might wash you out. Satan has asked for you that he might crush you down. Satan has asked for you that he might get you out of the picture. That's a pretty, listen here, that's a pretty crazy thing that Jesus just told Satan, Peter that Satan knows his name. Satan has asked for you. I love what it says, though. I love what this says. Verse number 32, Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. Hallelujah. We got Jesus praying for us. Yeah. Jesus says, but see, Peter, I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you that you're going to come out on top. Does it say that? I have prayed for you that you're going to be blessed beyond your wildest dreams, Peter. Does it say that? I have faith. I have prayed for you, Peter. That you're gonna, it's, you, this situation, you're gonna go right through, you're gonna skate by, ain't gonna have no problems. Does it say that? Yeah. What is Jesus? Jesus, you think you could have prayed a little bit nicer prayer? He says, Peter, I prayed that your faith would not fail. Yeah. I prayed that your faith would not fail. Why? Because it wasn't Peter that was under attack, it was Peter's faith that was under attack. Yeah. Because the devil knew if he got Peter's faith, his belief, Peter would walk away in shame. Yeah. Hey, listen, guys, he's asked to sift you as wheat. He has desired to get you out. But Jesus said, I have come to bring life and to bring it more abundantly. You don't got to let the devil take you out, but he's going to try. 
I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Look what he says. This is the encouragement. I love this. And when you have returned to me, <laughs> Peter, Peter, after you're done backsliding and denying me, yeah. strengthen your brethren. You remember the story in John the 20, at the end of John? When Jesus is on the seashore and he says to Peter, feed my sheep, feed my fish, or feed my lambs, feed my sheep. That was Peter's return. That was it. What did Peter do from that moment forward? He looked at his failure and he says, I will not fail again. Peter rose up to be the leader of the first church. Yeah, yeah. See, just because you make a mistake, just because you didn't pass the test, it's okay. Come back to God. Say, Lord, I did not pass. And Jesus will say, do you love me more than these? Learn from your mistake and move forward. Look what it says. Let me just read it to you. And we're going to go back to Genesis in the third chapter. If you want to go back there, you can go back there, but we'll read it. See, the devil can't stop God, but he can stop you. He can rob you. He can trick you. He can deceive you into living your faith. You've heard this statement before. I love this. I've been waiting. I've been waiting years to say this statement. This is the oldest trick in the book. You're not getting it. You're not getting it. The book is the Bible, okay? The book is, we call that the great book, right? This is the oldest trick in the book, the Bible. Why? Look at Genesis, the third chapter. Look at this, the oldest trick in the Bible. You know, you know what's amazing is the devil doesn't change the way he does things. He just changes the way it looks. Yeah. It's the same methods. It's the same methods over millenniums. It's been the same way. He's going to try to get you to give it up. He's not going to show up and beat you up over it. He's going to try to get you to give it up. He don't want it. He doesn't, he's not going to show up to the fight because he knows he's on your side. Okay, that's a different message. Genesis, the third chapter, verse number one. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, listen to, listen, to, listen to the oldest trick in the book. Here it is. Here it is. Has God not indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? He says, Eve, has God, God not told you you can't eat of any tree? You can't eat anything. Eve looks at him like, you are dumb. He didn't say you can't eat of every tree. Look what she says. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse number three, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it. Why? Lest you die. You dumb snake. God didn't say we can't eat of all the trees. He said we can eat of every tree but that one. See, he's already trying to undermine and demean what God said. See his craftiness here? The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, seeing good and evil. So listen to this. Now he has changed her perspective. He has brought to her perspective his point of view. Look what it says. Now when the woman saw that the tree was good. See, before she didn't see it was good for food. She saw that as I ain't going near that tree. I ain't going near that tree. When she saw the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Oh, it looked good. The tree was desirable to make one wise. Oh, I'll be better off if I have it. Does that, oh my Lord, let me get off my soapbox. Does that not sound like sin today? Yeah. Those things on the internet, they're pleasing to the eye. I'll be beneficial. Taking that money under the table. Oh, it sounds good to me. I don't got to pay my taxes on that. Make some more money. Does that not sound exactly the way sin works in our lives today? It's the oldest trick in the book. He changed her perspective, and look what she did. She took the fruit and ate, and she also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Yada, yada, yada. One thing led to another. Here we are today. <laughs> it's the oldest trick in the book. He's going to try to get you to give up your faith. He's going to try to get you to give up on what you believe. He's going to try to get you to believe you can't fight through this or you can't make through this. You can't make it through this. He's going to try to tempt you. He's going to try to push you and squeeze you in every which way possible. But you know what the beautiful thing is? 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, gives us hope for the, for, the for the test. Did you know that when you are tested by the devil, you can ace that test? That you can slap the devil? Look what it says in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. You're not going to fight the devil physically. You're going to fight the devil in faith. That's why Paul told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Verse number 5 goes on to say, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Hmm, that tree looked good. It looked like it was good for food. If I eat it, it's going to make me wiser. Casting those down and saying, no, that's not God that said that. Casting down Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Look at verse number six. Do we have verse number six? And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is filled. You want to know how to slap the devil? Pass the test. There it is. Slap the devil, pass the test. Why? Because the testing of your faith produces patience. And when the devil comes and rubs you the wrong way, guess what happens to you? You get stronger. You know what that means? That means that the devil's going to have to work harder the next time. And then he's going to come and he's going to rub you the wrong way again. And guess what happens again? You're going to get stronger. And then he's going to have to work harder and harder and harder, meaning that he's going to want to stop. But he's never going to stop because he, he can't stop God. But he's going to try to stop you. But guess what? You can win. You can win. Last one for tonight. Can we do one more? Yeah. Uno mas. Here we go. Our faith is tested, number three, by us. Look at your neighbor and say, by us. Now, see, I wasn't talking about your neighbor. I'm talking about you. You say, yeah, Pastor Luke, some of the husbands or the wives are saying, Pastor Luke, amen. <laughs> Elijah even said it today. If you want freedom from your husband or wife, I thought, man, what does that mean, Elijah? <laughs> Some of us are scratching our heads like, what does that mean? No, it does not mean what you think it means. You test your faith. Did you know that? You test your faith. We talked about this a little bit last week. The doubt is the antidote to faith. You want to kill your faith? Start doubting. You'll watch it drown. You'll watch it go down the drain. You will see it happen. You test your faith. But you know what else? You push yourself. You put yourself in positions that rely on faith. Or if you don't, somebody else will. God wants you to move forward. you got to test your faith. The disciples, if you've got your Bible, turn with me to Luke in the 17th chapter. Luke in the 17th chapter. We're in Luke in the 21st chapter. Unless you turn to Genesis in the third chapter. But Luke in the 17th chapter, the disciples asked Jesus a great question. And actually, they said a statement to him more than anything. Verse number five, they say, Lord, increase our faith. Jesus, increase my faith. You know what they were thinking when they asked Jesus that? Pour it on. Jesus, pull out the bucket of faith. Just dump it on me. All right, I want to go from like level one to level five right away. Lord, increase our faith. I love how Jesus just doesn't come back and say, okay. Look what he goes on to say, verse number six. Verse number six. There we go. The Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. See, it's not about size, it's about quality. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. Great faith. Verse number 7 goes on to say, And which of you, having a servant... See, I love this. Jesus, the, the, Lord, increase our faith. And all of a sudden he goes into a story. Because he, he, he's an illustrative person. He likes to paint the picture for them. So instead of just saying yes, or instead of just saying no, he says, this is what it's going to be like. Which one of you, having a servant, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he, when he comes in from the field... Come and sit down. And look. Which one of you who pays somebody to do this work says when you're done with the work, well, come on, sit down, kick up your feet. Rest and eat dinner with me. What does he say? Verse number, verse number eight goes on to say, but he will not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk. And afterwards, you will eat and drink. Meaning, I'm the boss, you're the servant. When your job is fulfilled, then you can do what you need to do. But the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. What does this have to do with anything? Look at what it says. Verse number 9. 
Does he thank the servant because he did the things that he was commanded him? I think not. He's a servant. Look what it says, verse number 10. Likewise you. Here's your answer. Lord, increase our faith. Likewise you, when you have done all the things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. You know what Jesus just said? You want to increase your faith? Just do what you're told. Do your mission. Live your calling. You want to increase your faith? Do what you're supposed to do and you'll advance. It's like you want to, you want to increase your position at your job? What do you do? You work harder, right? You don't lean against the counters or, or talk more than everybody else or stand at the water cooler as long as you can if you're looking for that management position, right? You dress nicer, you work harder, you come earlier and you stay later than everybody else. Jesus says, you want to increase your faith? You want to go from level one to level five? Start working, start doing something, start living the life that you're supposed to live. And as you do, you'll look back. Remember, we use this word hindsight. As you do, in hindsight, you'll look back and say, wow, what used to take me two days to do just took me one day. Because you just got stronger, you got better, you got faster, you became more agile at it. See, this works all day long in, in our physical lives. But we think, oh, it's got to be different in our faith. It's the same principles. Jesus says, you want to increase your faith? You want to stretch yourself? Start doing something. When we started this Capital Stewardship Campaign a year ago, even though we launched just a few months ago, we started planning this a year ago. We sat down, Pastor Jim, Pastor Deborah, Pastor Dan, myself, and some of the, the leaders of the staff, and we said, who's going to lead this thing? Everybody kind of looked around. I popped my hand up and said, I'll do it. And they said, you want to do it? I said, no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> but I said, I know I could. I know I can. I know that God's going to push me through this. And I remember I was talking to another church, one of our friend churches that are going through the same process. I was talking to his administrator. And his administrator is where I was at six months ago. And he was panicking the way I panicked six months ago. You say, Pastor Luke, what happened six months ago? Nothing. Exactly. And I remember looking back, and now in hindsight, I can say, wow, my faith to believe for this a year ago, man, that, that, was, that, that was like a triumph to get there. Now I look back a year later and say, wow, the testing of my faith. I was stretched. I did my job. I worked hard at it. I stayed later. I worked hard. I worked on my days off. I did the things that I didn't necessarily want to do, but I was called to do what I was supposed to do. I look back a year later and say, wow, the things that I can believe for now are easy compared to what I thought they could be a year ago. Why? Because my faith has increased. Do your job. Do it. That's all there is to it. Let me conclude with this, just, just to say this. James in the first chapter, verse number five, I'll just put it up on the overhead. If anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Look what he says in verse number six. Let him ask in faith. Let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose he'll receive anything for the Lord. He's a double-minded man and stable in all his ways. You'll test your faith. Doubt and skepticism will tell you this isn't right. You can't do this. This isn't the way it's done. Everybody else around me is doing it differently or saying it differently. You will test your own faith. You will either stretch and put yourself in positions to grow your faith, or you will put yourself in positions to reduce your faith by doubt, by skepticism, or by worry. And I want to encourage you today, don't be the latter. Don't allow doubt to drown your faith. Don't allow skepticism to drown out your faith, but rather stick your neck out and say, God, I'm going all in for you. God, I'm going all in that I know... I have forward thinking in my mentality and that my, my mind, my body, my heart, my emotions say right now to quit and walk away. But I know that when I look back on this tomorrow, the years in ahead, the months ahead, the years ahead of my life, that I will look back on this situation and I will say, wow, I came out on top. Because the testing of your faith produces patience. And in conclusion, let me read this to you. First Peter, the... First chapter, verse number six in the New Living Translation, a more modern translation, says this, So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. Many trials for a little while. These trials will show your faith is genuine. It is being tested as a fire 
tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, listen to what this says, so when your faith remains. You see, did you catch that word? When your faith remains. Not if, so if, you're going to be tested. You're going to be tested like fire. It's going to burn up everything you do, and it's either going to last or it's going to endure. And it says here, and when your faith endures. See, that's an encouragement saying, guess what? You're going to make it through it. You're going to make it through it. God's going to bring some things to you. There's some commands in the Bible that are going to rub you the wrong way, like love your neighbor. Ah! It's going to test your faith. Guess what? You're going to make it through it. The devil's going to come. He's going to try to take everything you have. He's going to ask to sift you as wheat. But let me tell you something. You're going to make it through it. You're going to have doubts. You're going to have worries. But you're going to stretch yourself out and say, did I go too far? And you're going to make it through. Why? Because you're going to be refined by God. And in the end, when, not if, your faith endures. Your faith remains strong through many trials. It will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. In the end, when you see God face to face, he's going to look down at you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because we are people of great faith. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Listen, let me do something. Let me ask you a question. Please remain seated. Give me a moment more of your time. I've been saying this, but this is it. Last thing we're going to do today. Let me ask you this question. I want you to answer it within your hearts honestly. Let's be open and honest. You know, nobody's going to know this answer except you and God. You can't fool God. So let's just be open and honest about it. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? It's a very simple question. Let's go over that answer. You know, you might say, oh, Pastor, look, I'm going to get to heaven. Let me ask you this. What makes you think you're going to get there? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can think, hope, or want your way into heaven? I think I can, I think I can, you're going to get to heaven. Not going to get to heaven that way. Did you know in the Bible you'll never find that it says that because you attend church on Sunday or on a Wednesday, because your parents baptized you as a baby or christened you, because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter, that you're going to get to heaven? You can't get to heaven because you sit in a chair in a sanctuary. You're not going to get there that way. You're not going to find it. There's more to it than that. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I'm going to get to heaven because I'm a good person. I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't drive too fast on the, on the freeway. I get to charitable organizations. I wear shoes that help other people in, in impoverished co- countries. Good people go to heaven. Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that good people make it into heaven? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get to heaven. You can't get there that way. Well, you might say, Pastor Luke, you know, I grew up in church. My parents told me all my life I was a Christian. I call myself a Christian. When somebody asks me, I say I'm a Christian. Did you know that no one in the Bible doesn't say that because you've given yourself the title or the name of Christian, because your parents told you you were a Christian, you've always believed that, that that means you're going to get to heaven? You can't get to heaven by giving yourself a name. That's like calling yourself a Dodger and going and sit down in the Dodgers dugout and thinking that you're actually a part of the Dodgers team. They're going to throw you out and lock you up. You can't get to heaven because you call yourself a Christian. not going to get there that way. Well, but Pastor Luke, I've served in the youth ministry, the children's ministry. I was an usher or a leader in the, in, in, in the church. I carried the pastor's Bible. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get to heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you, got, you can get to heaven because you served in the children's or youth ministries, because you sang in the choir or carried the pastor's Bible. Hey, nowhere in the Bible does it say because you're a leader in the church or because you memorized some scripture that you're going to get into heaven. You know what the Bible tells us? That the devil himself knows the scripture. He proves that through, to us by quoting it. Yet he's not going to get to heaven because he knows the word of God. There's more to it than that. You might say, well, Pastor Luke, I know who God is. I know who Jesus is. I know John 3.16. I know all about that stuff. Doesn't, doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? The Bible tells us the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, know who God is. Yet they're not going to find their way into heaven because they know who God is. You're not going to get to heaven because you know who Jesus is. Because there's more to it than that. Jesus, speaking to a religious leader of his day in John the third chapter, Speaking to a religious leader of his day, says this. He says, you know what? In order to get to heaven, here's how you do it. It's not about wearing your clothes. We're not about memorizing the verses. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Jesus says you must be born again. That's it. That's God's way. There it is. It's God's heaven. It's God's way. The only way we can get there is God's way. And Jesus says this. To get to heaven, you must be born again. Now, you think of radical, crazy, weirdo, out-of-control Christianity, but let me tell you something. I don't care what you think or what society has made it out to be because from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. Here it is. You ready? That you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all-or-nothing relationship with God. That's it. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. 
In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. People like you and I, sitting together, hearing the word of God, going out, doing good things in the name of God, speaking to the church. And he says, when I come back, I better find you hot. I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Words of Jesus Christ. Wow. Shocking, rude, and crude statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define it for you in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ. It means that you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down. You're kind of floating around. Occasional church attendance, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're not wholehearted for God, but you're not wholehearted against God. You're running the, riding the fence right down the middle. Jesus says, if that's you, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. Here I am today. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to be in your face about it and to tell you the truth that you're not going to get to heaven because you think you're going to get there. You're not going to get to heaven because your parents told you you're going to get there. You're not going to get to heaven because you do good things. You're not going to get to heaven because you go to church. You're not going to get to heaven because you think you, you, you have a good relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember, the devil is going to come and try to tell you it's all good. But only God, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit confirms in our hearts that we are children of God. Don't let anybody else tell you anything else but God. I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough, honor, honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. Can't get to heaven any other way but God's way. It's God's heaven, it's God's way. And Jesus Christ said this, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father. Listen to me, no one goes to the Father except through him. Can't get there any other way. You might say, Pastor Luke... You know, I, I've always thought that all, lo all roads lead to heaven. I, I believe in everything. or I, I, just, I know that there's a God out there, and I know eventually I'll find my way there. Let me tell you something. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You can't get to, to heaven that way. You're not going to get there. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth. I don't even care if you believe in heaven or hell. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not real. It's very real in this place. You need to, you need to think about that for a moment. Here's how we do it. You say, well, Pastor Luke, how do we get to heaven? Let me, let me help you out there. Here's how we do it. Jesus Christ said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, he said, I'll deny you before my Father. So just a moment, I'm going to give you that opportunity to give your heart, give your life to Jesus Christ. And here's what I'm going to do. Just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hand on my Bible. Just like that, real loud. And if that's you in this place, I want to give you the opportunity to give your heart, give your life to Jesus Christ. And what, what I want you to do is I want you to be bold. In just a moment, I want you to pop your hand up when I count to three. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give him all my heart. Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all my life. Pastor Luke, I want to make sure I get to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. It wasn't designed for you in the first place. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't know if I can raise my hand. I'm going to be embarrassed. The people I came with are going to know where I'm at. Yeah, you know what? You might be embarrassed. I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God in a warm and welcome and loving place like the church? You see, the decision is yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. He's already done everything he could to ensure that you get to heaven. Hell was never designed for you. God did everything he could to ensure you get to heaven by giving his most valuable and prized possession, his son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess, to hang naked, a spectacle for the world to see on a cross, to bear your sin and your shame so that you can give him all your heart, you can give him all your life, and make sure that you live eternity, live through eternity with him in heaven. It's your decision. Who should raise their hand if you've never given him all your heart, you've never given him all your life in just a moment? Pop your hand up. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure, make sure. Don't leave this place without making sure. That's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. The Bible says that our life is but a vapor. You all know somebody or have heard of somebody that in a moment their life was gone. Don't walk out of this place and bank on the fact that you've got tomorrow. You don't know. Make sure tonight. Who should raise their hand? Maybe you did this as a kid or you did this at a harvest or Billy Graham crusade, but you never really followed through with it. Let's make today the day you follow through and really go forward for God. And finally, who should raise their hand? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, running from God instead of to God. Today, let's make it the day you go hot for God and ensure your place in heaven with God forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. The decision's yours. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If that's you, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. We'll move forward from there. The decision is yours. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't miss out. Here we go. Ready? All across this auditorium, if you're watching in, in the foyer by TV, or if you're watching online right now, get ready. Get your hand up wherever you're at. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. I see you. One. Anybody else in this place? Two, three. I see you. Four. I see you right there. Four wise people. Anybody else in this place today? 
Anybody else in this place today? You say, I want to give him all my heart. I want to give him all my life. Anybody else in this place today? Uh, I see, uh, six, I see you. Or five, I'm sorry, I see you. I can, I can count. Seven, I see that hand back there. Thank you. Seven wise people, where are you at? You say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. You need to. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Today is the day of your salvation. Come on, let's move forward today. Eight, I see you. Where are you at, number nine? Where are you at, number ten? You say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. You should! Quit playing games with God today, and let's go forward in your relationship. Anybody else in this place today? Eight wise people. Anybody else today? I'm going to close this up right now. Anybody else? Well, praise God for eight wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do. For the eight of you that raised your hands, number nine, number ten, that didn't raise your hand, but you should have, it's not too late. Remember I said you, when you raise your hand, you want to give them all your heart, you give them all your life. You don't get saved by raising your hand, you acknowledge that you want to give them all your heart. Now what I want to do is I want to ask you to be bold. We're going to all stand together in just a moment. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. And if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend, if you need a friend, look to the person next to you and say, will you come with me if you have to? That's okay. Or if somebody raised their hands next to you, look at them and say, I'll go with you. And as everybody stands, I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair, and meet me up here at the aisle, and let's change destinies together. If you're serious about this, come on, as we stand together, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, and come and meet me up here. And let's change destinies together. That's you. Come on. Jesus, you can come. Please, nobody leave right now. You can come. Come on. You can come. Jesus, I if that's you, come on. Wherever you're at. You come, come on. Jesus, You can come. Jesus, Well, praise God. Hey, listen, today is the first day of the rest of your life. You know you're not going to a funeral? You're going to a birthday. Today's your new birthday. Hey, listen, I want to do something. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This right over here is Dr. Becker. He's waving at you. Dr. Becker's really cool. I mean, Dr. Becker is like the coolest guy. He's so easy to be around. He's going to do a couple things. He's going to take you right over there. Listen, I promise nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it, got, as it gets, okay? You survived me. He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by just raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. He's going to lead you in a prayer real easy. He's going to give you some free literature, some things to read, some things to take home so that you can read about so you can get strong in the ways of God. And the last thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. They're called spiritual personal trainers. Like you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer to help you make sure that you're working out those, those equipment right and making sure you're, you're not wasting your time. A spiritual personal trainer, somebody will meet with you before church. They'll get you a cup of coffee, teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong for a couple of weeks so that way you don't go back to the life that you came from. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over here with Dr. Becky. Praise God. Woo-hoo. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you. In the name of Jesus, I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.